This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. How many people in the room have been to Fresno? Okay, good. You can come on back, visit me anytime. I love it. It's the best little city in the USA. We have a sign, so it must be true. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about why Fresno is a center of excellence for wilderness medicine. We train all National Park Service rangers in the country who become a park medic ranger. Um, and so that's an advanced level of care that is special to the national parks. Uh, we've been doing it for 30 years. And so we're going to really talk today about the kind of practical things that we teach those rangers uh, twice a year at their educational sessions. Um, so if you're here for pythons or things that you know, you're not really going to encounter in a national park, um, we can touch, uh, touch on it, but that's not really the focus of this talk. It's going to be things that you could actually encounter and have problems with. So this is the goals I have uh, by the end of the talk. I want you to be able to identify venomous snakes and spiders, uh, particularly ones that you might encounter, um, and ones that are not going to be an issue for you if you're here in California. I want you to be able to develop treatment strategies for potential envenom envenomations of you or your friends or your family. And uh, we're also going to be able to distinguish between limb-threatening and life-threatening envenom envenomations. And this is a fairly important distinction because many of the actions taken by people who are victims of envenomations are actually harmful because they think that they're going to die. Um, and so they do things that will actually threaten the use of their future appendage um, in order to not die. Uh, but we actually have modern medical therapies that make death a very fleetingly small possibility uh, for many of these uh, encounters. Now, I just want a show of hands, if you will. Uh, how many people have ever been uh, pretty much bit by a black widow spider? One person, is that it? Wave it around if you have it up and I can't say, okay, one person. I'm so sorry. Uh, we're going to hear about why that sucks. Uh, so, and how many people have been stung by a bee or a yellow jacket or a wasp? Okay, that is most of the room. Okay, we're going to talk about what are the like big killers in the United States in terms of animal encounters. Um, and some people like to say, oh, well, you know, Mosquitoes are really bad. They kill people with, you know, malaria and other transmitted illnesses. Now, that's not the mosquito's fault. Um, it's just sort of a victim in that cycle. So what do you think the number one killer of people in the United States is? Bee stings. Good. Anaphylaxis. Good choice. Anyone else? Well, so since we've all been stung and none of us are dead, that's a good choice. We encounter these things a lot. Um, it's actually cows horses, pigs, and other mammals, according to a study done in 2012 in Stanford. So be very, very wary of those things. <laughs> so first I want to show you something cool. I, I had a pet tarantula. Actually, many of them realized that uh, it's really hard to feed a pet tarantula, and they just die, and it was really sad. And after a couple of uh, dead spiders, I realized I probably shouldn't pick them up and put them in jars anymore. Um, this is the learning at the age of five. Um, but anyway, tarantulas are super cool. You have a great one in San Francisco I visited today. It's called the, uh, the Pink Bird Eater Tarantula. It's from Brazil. It actually does not eat birds. Um, it's about palm sized and you should go visit it. Um, so are tarantulas dangerous when they bite? Not really. Um, evidently, if you get a big enough tarantula, it can feel like a cat bite because the fangs can get pretty big, so that's a pretty serious, painful bite, but it shouldn't really harm you. The real problem is what's called the urticating hairs. The tarantula, when you upset it, it rears up, um, puts its feet up in the air, and raises its fangs, um, and that says stop doing what you're doing. Um, and then after that, it turns around, takes its rear legs, and flicks its abdomen, and the hair comes off in like plumes, um, and you can see it if it's in the right light. Um, now that hair actually can just just cause a lot of itching, burning, or pain. What's interesting, though, is that uh, if those urticating hairs, if you're trying to really stare closely while filming this, uh, if they get in your eyes, you can actually have blindness as a result of those hairs going into your eyes. So I'm going to have the group with package number one. If you have it, please raise it in the air. It says number one on it. Oh, there you are, very trusty. Can you carefully open package number one? Um, and what I'd like you to do is uh, state at least one symptom of the bite, and, and focus on the package. Everyone's going to be wondering what you're looking at. Don't look up. I'll show them what you're looking at. It's not alive. I'm not that mean to you. I know we're rednecks in Fresno, but we're not that bad. <laughs> All right, so one symptom of the bite. Ow. Ow. Okay, great. Excellent. 
Yes, San Francisco. Um, so this is, everyone knows? All right. Um, and so it's called the Lactrodectus mactans or Hesurpus, depending on where you are. Um, I first, my first publication as a physician, I forgot the uh, R and I called it the Lactodectus, which stands for milk spider. And uh, the first response to my amazing paper was, it's not the milk spider. Really embarrassing. Uh, but the black widow is a cool spider. They're very, very common. We've had a bite in the room. And uh, pretty much all species across the world have a very similar clinical presentation. So once you know what one black widow does, uh, or any widow, you'll know what they all do. Um, they can look significantly different, though. Um, this is really a beautiful spider. Also, same family as the brown widow. Here's another one, also same family. It is the red leg spider. And so let's talk a little bit about these bites. Um, these are relatively aggressive spiders, and we used to have a lot of people who were bit by these. Um, and why? Because up until 1963, the United States commonly had outhouses as a normal toilet function, uh, not in Fresno or San Francisco, but evidently the middle of the country. And so the common clinical presentation you would get is that someone would go to the outhouse, sit down, um, there would be a spider in this kind of cool, comfortable place, um, and the spider thought it had a view, and then it didn't. Um, and so, you know, they'd sit down and you'd feel kind of a pinprick, but nothing really that bad. You'd think, oh gosh, maybe that was a splinter on the outhouse, whatever, and then some time would go by and you'd start to feel terrible. Um, you'd have nausea and vomiting and your stomach would hurt and you'd go to the hospital and say, I don't know, I was using the bathroom, now I feel terrible. And so what would they do? You'd come in there and your stomach's rock hard, that hurts and you're vomiting. Well, gosh, they would just take out your appendix. And it was amazing how many negative appendectomies were done. And they were done because people were getting bit by this spider that really doesn't have much of a bite um, with all these symptoms that don't say spider bite. <clears throat> So just kind of a thing to know, um, if you have a little kid, you can have a kid have seizures or fasciculations, which is tremoring of the muscles uh, as a presentation. And these are usually not dangerous, but most things that aren't dangerous can be a little harmful in the very, very young and the very, very old. Why the very, very young? Uh, because they're so small compared to the venom, and so it's a little more of a risk. Why the very, very old? I don't know. I think you're just unlucky. Um, but really, it's because one thing you can get with the Black Widow is what they call a hypertensive emergency, where your blood pressure goes up. Um, and with any cause of a hypertensive emergency, that can lead to heart attack, stroke, uh, blindness, really bad problems. So what did we do about this? Well, I can tell you what we used to do in the day of the outhouse is there was all these papers telling you to give this drug, calcium gluconate. Um, but there were some studies done. And when you only have one drug to give, everyone gives it. But they found that 96% of the severe bites required pretty much a lot of pain medication after giving this calcium gluc gluconate. And so we don't give this anymore. Um, now we just give a whole lot of pain medication. And some people ask, is there an antivenom? And yes, there is. Now, the antivenom that is currently available is made in, in Central America. Um, they just finished a phase three trial. I don't know if you have it in San Francisco. I can tell you the only time I've ever administered this antivenom was while we were a study site for it. And the minute the study ended, the antivenom sort of went away. Um, that being said, it, the antivenom was sort of interesting in that once you gave it, the pain and all the symptoms were gone in about 30 minutes. Uh, but it's about $10,000 a vial. And for people being uncomfortable, they thought that wasn't worth it. And so our hospital didn't stock it anymore. It pretty much is a medication that prevents an admission to the hospital if someone's really looking bad. Um, and in that case, we just give a lot more pain medication or admit them now. So package number two, if you can raise it gently into the air. Yes. All right, so you're going to look at that spider, and I'm going to show everyone else what it is. And the question is yes or no. Does everyone around you think those live in California? This is what's in the package. Hmm. So the distinguishing mark on this, um, this spider, if you've not seen it before, is on its mid-thorax. You can see that there's a dark mark uh, that looks like a violin. And so people will swear that they have identified this violin on the spider that has bit them. Now, I don't know if you can rotate the spider box you have there in the air, uh, but this spider is almost smaller than your pinky. So how people are seeing that violin, I'm not quite sure. Um, but we do have a relative. That's the brown recluse that's in the box. Um, we have a relative called the hobo spider. The hobo spider does live here in California, and the problem with these types of spiders is it's been known to cause what they call a necrotizing bite, which means that the venom in the bite causes all the skin to break down. 
Uh, so, the brown recluse, it's known as the Loxosceles species, um, and they are reclusive. They live in the places where spiders live. Um, they also have delayed pain, so a painful spider bite is neither of these two spiders that we've just talked about. Um, but what's so famous about these spiders is these necrotic wounds cause, can cause what's called a volcano lesion. Um, you don't want to put ice on these because if you concentrate the venom, the lesion will get worse. Um, the treatments include hyperbaric oxygen, uh, surgery, a medication called Dapsone. There is no antivenom for these in the United States. They live in the southeast. Uh, but there is an antivenom in South America for this. So if you're in South America and you have a bite from one of these, they may actually give you an antivenom. So this is, uh, this is a very mild brown recluse. They don't all have to necrose in the middle. Um, but that's not true for every bite. Um, this is what it can look like if it starts to necrose right away. It kind of looks gummy and gross and yellow. And that can then turn into this volcano lesion uh, where the skin kind of puffs up. This is especially more likely if you put ice on the wound. It'll concentrate the venom and the wound will get worse. Now that can just heal over with a scar, which looks really unsightly, but is fine. Or you can actually go on to have a really nasty bite that requires surgery. Now, to be fair, most people who have wounds that turn into this have other things that put them at a higher risk of poor wound healing, such as cigarette smoking or diabetes. Um, but that being said, this is real venom, and, and this can happen to someone with none of those risk factors. But we do not have these in California. I'm going to tell you a story. I won't mention their name, but a good friend of mine uh, went to an outhouse in Yosemite National Park, was bit by a hobo uh, in a place that you don't want to be bit. And it was before her anniversary weekend. And it kept getting bigger and more swollen. And she's like, I think that I need to go to the hospital. And so there she is with her legs in the stirrups. And they're like, oh, well, I don't know if we really want to cut that there. Um, and so she said, please don't cut that there. And they waited about two and a half days with some antibiotics. And it completely resolved. All right, question number three. Uh, you have just been bitten by the specimen in your bag. Can you raise the bag way up high? OK, while you open that up, everyone's going to look and see what it is on the screen. Since you're not looking at the screen, you're looking at the box. So this is what's in the box. It's not alive. So let's talk a little bit about snakes. Um, has anyone in the room ever been bitten by a snake? One person? Anyone else? Two person? Three person? Any snake? Any snake. Well, now that I've got any snake, I've got six people, seven people bitten by it. Eight people? Wow, OK, great. So we definitely have snake bites. Now let me tell you, uh, of the people, the seven people in the room, keep your hand up if you reported it. OK, no one. So this brings up the first point, that it is estimated there are 5,000 snake bites a year. Um, but it is said it is underreported. And so why is it underreported? Well, one, because people are like, that snake wasn't dangerous. I'm cool. I don't need to do anything. Uh, there's another reason it's underreported, is there are some people who are a bit doing things that are particularly not wise. Uh, and then they don't go to the hospital. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you a picture of that that's real. Um, and I'm not making fun of anybody, but it's a real thing. And you can judge for yourself what you think of that. Um, a quarter of those bites are presumed to be poisonous snakes. There are two families in the United States, the pit vipers, uh, which are in the Crotillidae, and the elapidae, which are the coral snakes. There's death in 0.5% of these snake bites. Um, in a 15-year span, that's about it was like 180 people in 15 years in the United States died. 15 years in the US died from snake bites. So it's not very common. You have more likely chance of getting struck by lightning and dying. Um, but usually, that's resulted by a delay in care. So let's talk about how that works. This is, um, if, if you're not aware of this, this is real. When you feel the anointing and God moves on you to take up serpents, even if one of them lays fangs into you, you shall not be harmed. So in the south, where brown recluse spiders are, there are uh, small but numerous uh, small pockets of people who practice snake handling. And they strongly discourage members who are bit by the snake from seeking medical care. Um, and these people tend to die uh, because the envenomation is usually clinically significant. Um, and the reason why is they say, if you go and you seek medical care, then you don't believe that God is going to heal you. Um, after like yanking around a snake that probably wasn't really happy being handled. I mean, so this can be a really serious problem due to a lack of education that people need to get medical care. So next package, number four, you have several snakes in the package. I heard the lid come off. 
They're up in the back corner, and this is what they're looking at, looking at one of these. Anyone know what this is? That's a cotton mouth, it's a nice white mouth. And they have one of these, which is a rattlesnake, Western Diamondback rattlesnake. And uh, this is another rattlesnake here. So they have all those. Are all those in the same family of snakes? Because they look kind of different. I mean, one doesn't even have a rattle. All right, the answer is yes. Yes, they are. And I'm going to show you these videos at the end uh, because they're in a file that I have to close to open. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about the family that these snakes are in, family and crotillidae. These are the, the, the pit vipers. Crotillids have triangular-shaped heads. They have elliptical pupils. I, I have been told they look like angry snakes because they have elliptical eyes, but so do cats, and cats don't look angry. Uh, and they have mobile front fangs, and there's a, there's a little model down here that you can take a look at at the end of the talk um, that actually shows they have several sets of fangs in reserve if they happen to break a fang off, which is really fascinating. They also are called pit vipers because they have an infrared heat sensing pit, which you can see on them, that enables them to locate prey, guide the direction of the strike, and determine how much venom is necessary in order to get dinner. Uh, they may or may not have a rattle. Um, they're also identified, if you pick one up, we have one in the front of the room, by a single row of subcaudal scales. Um, subcaudal scales are found around the anus of the snake. Now, if you are picking up a snake that's alive to check out the subcaudal scales, I think that you're going to deserve what happens. That's a bad plan. <laughs> Hope no one's from Montana. This sign is from there. I don't know how they train them not to go on the sidewalks. <laughs> All right, package number five, if you can open that up. Um, they're going to be looking at some snake parts. These are real snake parts. And just to review kind of the key things that you need to identify with venomous snakes. So I'm just going to show you a snake here since the parts are in the box. They're dead parts. They do not smell. Um, but what are the, the key distinguishing features of this copperhead snake being in this pit viper family? Again, the elliptical pupil, the heat sensing pit in the, in the front of the face there that you can see, and then they have a triangular head. Now the way that I remembered this, because uh, this triangular head thing is really key, is that it kind of looks like one of those twisty road signs. That's your snake. That's one to just back up if you see it. So let's talk a little bit about what happens if you're bit by a rattlesnake. Um, they're called hematopaths, which just means that they affect the blood primarily. There is one exception, uh, the Mojave Two-Step, uh, or also known as the Green Mojave, has a venom that also has a neurotoxin in it. But most pit vipers don't have any neurotoxin whatsoever. It's just a blood toxin. And the venom, when it's injected, directly injures the cells, and it can cause swelling right where you put it in there, uh, a lot of bruising, uh, again, necrosis, just like that brown recluse where it gets all gummy, and obviously pain, uh, because when your cells die, it hurts. Uh, coagulation, the way your blood clots, is also abnormal. It can decrease the number of platelets that are available to be used. Um, fibrinogen is something that can get activated in order to help you stop bleeding. That can be destroyed. And you can get this condition called DIC, which dis is disseminated intervascular coagulation, where you look all purple and blotchy, and then you die. Um, it's really awful. Um, and so it, what does that look like if you saw a person like that? On the bottom, you can see here these are rattlesnake victims with pretty significant systemic findings. These big purple bruises is because the blood is not clotting well. And that's, someone would be covered with those, someone who's pretty much terminally ill from that envenomation. Oh, and this is the Mojave Two-Step. It's beautiful, it's green. I would call it like the Mojave Marathon. I would run so far away from this thing because our anti-venom for pit vipers is not entirely effective uh, with this type of snake. Uh, so it's just something to be aware of. So I want to show you um, kind of some different pictures. This is a rattlesnake bite at 30 minutes. You can see there's a little bit of, of blood on the finger. Uh, that's about it. You don't see a lot of swelling. You don't see a lot of bruising. You don't see a lot of purple spots. Um, so this would be a really mild bite, bite meaning not a lot of venom went in. So you would watch this and make sure it didn't get worse. And if it didn't, I mean, in the emergency department, if it didn't get worse, you'd pretty much be done. We usually watch these people who have a mild bite for about six hours. Why do we wait that long? Because if death is on the list of things that can happen, a six hour wait is not that big of a deal. <laughs> so don't make that judgment for yourself. If this was my finger, I wouldn't just be like, oh, I'll sit it out at home. I would, 
I would, plus, they, you know, there's pain medications. There's lots of lovely things at hospitals that you just don't have at home, or you shouldn't have at home. <laughs> All right, so this is another bite. Um, and so I want to kind of give you a, a kind of a question here. You, you have this bite you're looking at. It's 15 hours in. Now, this looks really different than the other bite at 30 minutes. Why? Because it's really purple. It looks sort of bruised. Um, but again, how swollen is the finger? Not very. Um, so overall, this looks pretty good. This person would probably be discharged home as well. Now, let's say this person decided to put on a tourniquet and put some ice on the wound, and make sure that venom all stays in the same place so they don't die. Um, what can happen? Well, so this is what can happen when you do those things. Um, so if you trap the venom in a place, and then it will be much more destructive in that place, just like little kids have bigger problems because they're small, if you basically make yourself a small person by cutting off the circulation to the rest of you, you might lose a limb. I mean, so in, in general, as long as you have access to medical care, most rattlesnake bites in the United States are limb-threatening injuries, not life-threatening injuries. And provided you can get rapidly to medical care, they don't even have to really be a limb-threatening injury. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these interventions. I love this picture. It's just bothersome. Google is wonderful. I don't know that guy. <laughs> so tourniquets, um, should you put this on to decrease the amount of venom spreading to the rest of the system? No, not really unless you don't like that arm. I mean, you could be a motivational speaker, uh, but that's about it. Now, people get confused because if you go to Australia, they use what they call lymphatic bands, which are basically a loose tourniquet. Um, and people are like, well, they use it in Australia, but that's because almost everything in Australia can kill you. I um, mean, so that's a totally different situation. When it comes to being in North America, if it's a pit viper, don't use any kind of tourniquet. Um, just keep the limb in a place of comfort, uh, put it in a sling, take off anything restricting like watches and rings. Um, so if there is swelling, you don't have to lose those things forever being cut off. Um, so don't, don't do anything to, to restrict blood flow. Now, how about cutting it and sucking out the venom? This is a terrible idea as well. Uh, now, the reason is because it doesn't work. Now, if you could actually suck out the venom, that would be great. Uh, but we have many interesting studies on uh, how they have tried to recreate these, these fang, these curvilineal fang bites, and injected faux venom into a model, and tried to get it out by cutting and sucking, which is a lot of fun if you're a medical student to be involved in one of these. Uh, but you can't really get it out. Um, and so what you're going to end up doing is uh, you're going to have much bigger cuts on your arm, which are going to bleed more because the venom causes problems with clotting. And you're also going to put your mouth on there to suck it out because that's not going to work. But your mouth is full of bacteria, which is delicious, uh, as long as it stays in there, but not delicious on your arm. So you can really have a lot of local problems. So just don't, don't do that. And, and also, when you start cutting things, you might cut more than you were hoping to cut. Um, and then someone has to fix that, and uh, you don't really want a surgeon involved when you have a rattlesnake bite. So I'm just going to give you the two cardinal sins of rattlesnake treatment. These are still practiced uh, in some parts of the world that have no communication with anybody else. Uh, the first one is if you have any signs of venom spread, uh, to, to give inadequate or delayed anti-venom to someone who is having a significant envenomation. There is no reason not to give anti-venom anti -venom. if you have a patient whose arm or leg is swollen, they're getting blotchy, uh, their blood tests show that they're not clotting well, that person needs anti-venom now, and they need it in an adequate amount of quantity. Um, the adequate amount, starting dose, is usually six vials. Each vial is several thousand dollars a piece. Um, and so there might be other reasons people don't want to give anti-venom. Uh, if you know your bit and you're going to the hospital and you know it was a pit viper because it had a triangle and you know you're coming but you're like 30 minutes away because there's traffic, call and say, hi, you know what, I'm coming to the hospital and I was just bit by a rattlesnake. Why? Because this venom is in a powder because it's so expensive we don't want it to sit on the shelf because it can expire. And so it takes 30 minutes to swish it around to even be good to use. So if you wait till you get there, and someone's like, hey, that's a rattlesnake bite. And then 30 more minutes of call to pharmacy, and then 30 minutes of swishing before you get it. So uh, it's really good to just come in an ambulance because they call and say, oh, we have a rattlesnake bite. Um, so people will have everything ready when you get there. OK, the other thing that you want to avoid is consulting a surgeon because it used to be that surgeons felt that they were the temple of healing, and they would come down into the emergency department and say, oh, that looks terrible. That's very swollen. I think I should cut that. Um, 
which is fine if that would help, but you don't really get compartment syndrome, which is like so much swelling that you cut off blood flow uh, in rattlesnake bites. It used to be thought that all that swelling would actually jeopardize the limb, but it doesn't. I mean, so then what you would have is a rattlesnake bite with huge cuts on your arm uh, or leg to release the swelling that is still gonna be there. So consulting a surgeon is not a good idea, um, and it's been maybe only the last 10 years that that practice has almost entirely stopped for rattlesnake bites. Okay, so does, does size matter? Everyone's heard this one, I love myths. Everyone's like, oh yeah, little ones, you know, they can't control themselves and all the venom comes out. Who's heard that? Thank you, I used to teach that and then I realized I was wrong. Uh, there was a really cool study done in Loma Linda here in our proud state of California and they took 145 rattlesnake bites uh, and in those bites they only had one dry bite. So another myth, who's heard well, most snakes don't inject venom. That's, you know, I'd say like 15 to 30 percent. One snake out of 145 didn't do it. Um, so chances are, if you just take a look at this sample, that you're probably going to have uh, some venom injected. Now, is there a bias? Absolutely, because the people showing up at the hospital are a different group of people than the people who are like, that looks okay, and stay at home. So that's fair. But just be aware that you have to have a high level of suspicion. Anyway, they took a look at the snake size, and then they looked at what's called the snake bite severity score, which is how much swelling and blood test abnormalities there are. And guess what they found? That size does matter. The big snakes inject more venom. That's not a rattlesnake, by the way. But you also have these in San Francisco in your beautiful California Academy of Sciences, and I visited them today, too. Uh, these are the largest snakes in the world. Uh, the one you have here is 400 pounds. Um, and so I also looked it up because I thought someone would be really smart and say, do these boa constrictors, which do not normally live in the US but do live in San Francisco, behind glass, do they kill people? And I thought, that's ridiculous. Someone's going to ask that. I'm not going to know because I don't have a boa constrictor. Um, the answer is probably not. But there are two deaths. I looked it up for you because I was nervous about the level of this audience. Uh, there are two deaths, the most recent one occurring March 25th, 2017. Yeah, March 25th, 2017. That one was confirmed that the person was inside of the snake. Um, and so the other one, which you may have been familiar with, was in West Virginia a couple years back. Um, there was a girl, not a girl, she was a lady. She was something like 25 or 30. Um, and she was found dead next to the snake in her apartment, uh, but they actually investigated for murder uh, by someone else, not the snake, uh, because she was not ingested whatsoever. Um, and it was questionable, given the snake size, if it actually suffocated her or not, um, or if someone else actually just tried to make it look that way. Um, that, and they don't suffocate you. That's big news. Cutting edge here tonight. Boa constrictors don't suffocate their prey. Who knew? I didn't know that. Uh, they actually do it so they squeeze enough that your blood flow is disrupted. And so your heart can't pump against the pressure of the snake. And the blood returning to your heart can't return. And you're supposed to be out in just a couple of seconds. It's not so bad. <laughs> That's what they told the family of the Filipino farmer who was just found inside of one of these uh, in March of 2017. So. Uh, only one confirmed case, but it would suck to be that guy. Okay, package number six. Oh, this is the biggest package of them all. Okay, the question is, is this a venomous snake? This is what he's looking at. I want you all to think about it. He can raise it in the air, it's so beautiful. All right, so this is gonna, this is gonna be the only time during the talk where you clap. Uh, if you think this is venomous, clap and cheer loudly. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You shouldn't have. You guys are so nice. Um, that is correct. This is a coral snake. These are found in the South uh, US. I, I actually came from the South where all these horrible things are <laughs> today. Uh, so I just came in from Florida and I was thinking, oh my gosh, how cool. I could like come back with a brown recluse and a coral snake and they could be real. Um, but you know, it's amazing what people do in the South. Um, this is a bad idea. That's a, evidently a dead snake, but that's still really a super not smart idea. Uh, myth or, or truth, you can get envenomated from a dead snake. 
It's true. It is true. So do not do this. Um, is this a coral snake? Yes, it is. How do you know? Yeah, red next to yellow kill a fellow. Red next to ve black, venom lack, or friend of Jack. But I'm not a friend of Jack, so I like venom lack. Uh, but that's how I remember it. Red next to yellow can kill a fellow. Red next to black, venom lack. So this is what the bite looks like. Not very impressive. Um, it's kind of just looks like this tiny little thing. But why is everyone so afraid of them? Um, there's a lot of really dangerous snakes in this family. Uh, cobras, mambas, coral, and sea snakes. They're mostly in the southern US. Almost all of them are beautifully colorful. Um, over 200 species, and they're all very highly poisonous. They have tubular fangs. So these things don't just bite you. They're kind of like bad biters, so they have to like hang on and gnaw at your arm for a little bit, um, which would be horrifying in and of itself. Um, but the problem is, is they have neurotoxic venom, which can cause uh, a lot of problems, but also the main one being respiratory paralysis. Um, but no one wants to have a neurotoxin in their system, and so that's why these scare people. There is an anti-venom if you are in the southern US. Um, these are not very common. It's less than 0.5% of envenomations, and they are not here. So just let's just move on. So is this dangerous? No, perfect. OK, we're going to switch gears to things that are. Uh, there was something like 900 people who died in the last 15 years from this. This is a crazy picture. Why do people let this happen? Um, so let's talk a little bit about bees and wasps. So they have venom. Um, everyone talks about anaphylaxis, and we'll talk about why that's important. Um, but they actually have venom in and of themselves. And so how many you know, stings do you need to die. Uh, and guess what? They've answered this. Uh, about 19 stings per kilogram. A kilogram is something like 2.2 pounds. So it's about 10 stings per pound. So for a normal person, that's 500 to 1,400 stings, depending on how big you are. Um, now, the other thing is, is that feeling really bad from the venom by itself can be delayed quite some time. And so just because you were stung like eight hours ago, doesn't really mean you're totally in the clear. So if you start to have symptoms, uh, then you should probably get some help, and we'll talk about those symptoms. It's also more likely if you have more than 50 stings, um, and that's a more common with Africanized bees. Africanized bees are not really different than honeybees, except for one thing. They have a terrible attitude problem. And so with normal bees, you'll get like 10 stings. With Africanized bees, which are the basically the same family bees, but they're just angrier, um, you'll get up to like 2,000 bees following you. That's a big problem. So package number seven in the back corner, opening very carefully, because it has a sharp in it. And I'd feel bad if, uh, we, if you got that medication. So although it's expired, it's very expensive. Name the signs and symptoms that would cause you to administer this medication. Yeah, no one steal that. I need that back. <laughs> Swelling around the lips, excellent. <gasps> Sounds of trouble breathing. Let's talk a little bit about it. So anaphylaxis, um, it's an immune response that, uh, that really you know is happening when you have respiratory symptoms first. So edema of the vocal cords, which caused that really characteristic <gasps> sound of strider. I mean, I can do it all day, but you can't if you are having that because the vocal cords are swelling. Um, bronchospasm, where the, the airway is actually getting to swell up. Um, and those are the main things. that people start to have problems breathing, they feel like they're, they're really becoming hoarse, that's a sign that you may need to use an EpiPen. Um, now, I don't know if we're getting quite to the era where there's going to be EpiPens like AEDs everywhere, but it's been debated hotly that that's something that we should consider. Um, so it's worth knowing that those respiratory symptoms are the ones you need to pay attention to. Um, following that, you can have circulatory collapse uh, where your blood pressure drops. You can have an irregular heart rate. Uh, you can have a cardiac arrest. Um, that's really terrible. Um, now, anaphylaxis is the number one cause of death by bee stings or wasp stings or yellow jackets. Uh, usually only takes one to two stings in a sensitized person, and the onset of symptoms usually start in about 10 minutes after the sting. There's about 50 people a year who die of this. Um, so it's a, it's a big deal. Again, now, you're more likely to be struck by lightning, and if you have an EpiPen that's up to date, that's great. Um, but it is, it is a, it's the big killer, right after cows, horses, and pigs. I don't make it up. 
1,100 deaths. Cows versus pigs. Next is bees. <laughs> is that 50 a year in the United States? Yes, 50 a year in the United States. Isn't that shocking? I just, wow. Okay, well, maybe it's not shocking. I, I was shocked. Okay, so um, killer bees. Let's talk a little bit about it. You know, cool bee fact, if you're going to go to a cocktail party later, um, bees have hairs on their eyes. You can see that on the picture there. Who knew that? That is so special. So yellow jackets, wasps do not have eye hair. Um, and those are actually little hairs on the eye. But anyway, killer bees, uh, the, the only difference is you get a lot more stings because there's a lot more bees coming after you. Uh, they have a personality problem, and that is that they swarm. Uh, and so how far can they go? What are they going to do? You're outside. There's a swarm. Um, what you're supposed to do is just run. Um, but the problem with these things is they can swarm and follow you at 12 to 15 miles an hour. Uh, which is really fast. I'm a runner and uh, I can't run that fast. The video I'm going to show you says that you all can run that fast. I don't know. I run like five to six miles an hour on the treadmill. Uh, that's about a 12 minute mile. So I don't know how people are going 12 to 15 miles an hour, but you can only really keep up a 12 to 15 mile an hour run for a few minutes. Um, that's pretty much what you need. These won't follow you more than a quarter mile. So just run like you mean it. Now let's just say you don't really feel like running um, and you want to get away from these things. Well, you could like go in a pool of water and would that help you? Well, not really. They'll just wait for you to come out um, and they can wait for like a half an hour and you can't stay under there that long. Um, and so that's not a good solution. Now what these bees don't like doing is going indoors. So if you're near your car, get in the car. Who cares if 10 follow you in? You need 1,400 stings to die. So just get in the car with the 10 and kill them slowly. Um, or go in the house, you know, they don't want to go in your house. There's something about indoor spaces they don't like. The USDA says to run with your shirt over your face. Now, I don't know how you get in the house that way. Um, <laughs> but when you look at other animals that die from these bees, 90% of the, the stings kind of cluster on the, the eyes, the nose, the mouth pretty much your vital way of living, seeing, breathing. Um, and so when all this swells shut, you have big problems. Um, the other problem is, is people try to swat at the bees. Just that doesn't do anything. It just makes you more stressed out. Just go indoors with your shirt on your face. Uh, when you get indoors, you'll notice that uh, you are nauseated, not just because you had a near-death experience, but because it's scary. Um, you can have vomiting from the venom and headaches, among other problems. Let's talk a little bit about yellow jackets. Um, these are different. How do you know it's a yellow jacket? Well, one, if you're really close to it, you can see it doesn't have hair on its eyeball. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, you notice that they come up from the ground. And it's not because they're mean. It's because they have a nest down there. And they're just trying to get you away. Um, they can swarm, but they don't do it like a bee does. Um, so you normally see a yellow jacket, just kind of one come up at you from the ground. You back off, and you're usually fine. OK. So here is our summary. Avoid doing things that concentrate venom. I don't care if it's a snake or it's a spider. Just don't do it, um, because most of the time the venom can't kill you. Uh, and there are treatments for the venom if the venom can kill you. So just don't concentrate it. Um, so no ice, no lymphatic bands, no tourniquets. Uh, just don't concentrate it in one area. In terms of the crotalids, uh, just keeping in mind how to identify them is helpful, um, just to make you feel better. You shouldn't really antagonize a snake uh, anyway. And most people don't. We did a 10-year retrospective study in Central California of snake bite victims. And most people were not doing this, I would like a belt maneuver that everyone in the media says, oh, it's their fault. Uh, most people were putting their hands somewhere they couldn't see uh, while they were climbing or bouldering. It wasn't, it wasn't really their fault. Um, so anyway, if you are bit, it is helpful to know just by looking at the snake after it's happened. Um, does it have a triangular head? Uh, does it have a rattle? And if you have a rattlesnake fight, get evaluated for whether or not you need antivenom. Try not to make that decision on your own. Um, one clinical sign you can do right on scene when it happens um, is because rattlesnakes mess with the blood clotting mechanisms, oozing at the fang site is a very reliable sign of venom in the wound. But again, I would, if it was my arm, I wouldn't say, oh, it's not oozing, I'm good. I would just get checked out. Um, and then in stings, you know, you really want to recognize anaphylaxis, which is <gasps> airway problems, um, and stay alive by getting inside.
Okay, so the question is, anaphylaxis for bee string, is the epinephrine pin or the EpiPen enough, or do you need Benadryl and other treatments? Um, in some severe uh, reactions that aren't true anaphylaxis, the epinephrine may be en enough. Um, that being said, if it's truly anaphylaxis, most people end up getting more than one dose of epinephrine in the hospital setting. Um, and our rule is if you get epinephrine for an allergic reaction uh, by a healthcare provider, not in the field, uh, you are staying the night in the hospital to make sure that those symptoms don't recur after the epinephrine wears off. And we also give other medications that block allergic uh, mediators. Uh, there's a lot of histamines released. So besides Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, we also give a type of acid blocker for the stomach, not because these people are worried about reflux, but it, it happens to block a different type of histamine receptor. Um, so we do give more than just epinephrine. It's a good question. Yeah, so the question is, if you're in the deep in the backcountry and you're bit by a rattlesnake, um, there's, there's two important questions. One, are you alone? Um, if you are alone, I would walk out uh, until you get cell reception um, or until you run into somebody who can then run out after you pay them $100 to do so because they won't know you um, to activate the emergency medical system. Because once someone can activate EMS, they can get a helicopter to you. If you're alone, I would make yourself not alone by finding somebody. And if that's not possible, I would walk out. Um, keeping the affected extremity in like a sling or in a position of comfort with all the rings and constricting stuff off. Um, if I was with somebody, I would just make them go. I'd be like, you're my friend, and you won't be unless you go get somebody to help. And I would continue walking out, um, but I, I wouldn't sit down and wait for help. I would keep advancing toward it. Um, the question is, how quickly do you need to administer antivenom for it to be effective? Uh, good rule of thumb is, once you know you need it, uh, is a great time to administer it. So say there's a delay of a common situation we have. We, we receive a lot of snake bites in the Central Valley. Um, we're kind of a snake bite center of excellence because people get bit a lot. Um, and so they'll come from the foothills, uh, and then they'll come to an outlying hospital that doesn't have antivenom because it's expensive, uh, or they'll have two vials, which is not the six vial initial dose. And they'll administer those, and then they'll get to us. Um, and we'll just, once we see them, we administer them. There's no time that's too late to start if it's indicated. Thank you so much for your attention. And uh, again, take a chance to come and take a look at the specimens.